I'd like to start by asking you,、uh, what's your perspective on China's path to modernization? Like, how is it different from the Western approach? Well,、uh, yeah. When first of all, thanks very much for having me in this interview. And I would say that this question is most relevant, most interesting, and actually, you know, the whole world is talking about this question. Now, the way I look at it, China's modernization, particularly when set next to that of the West, China's modernization is both like that of the West. And unlike that of the West, so let me explain. So the way in which China's modernization is like that of the West is、uh, quite easily misunderstood because you know we live in an era where, for the last four decades, we all we have heard is、uh, you know in the West in Western discourse is all neoliberal discourse, you know, banging on about the merits of markets and free markets and free trade and blah blah and so on. But the fact of the matter is that this is not, in fact, how the West developed. If you look at the history of Western countries, they develop by careful management of trade and capital flows, with plenty of protection of infant industries, industrial policy, and so on. This is the real story of Western development. And now they preach to other countries, particularly third world countries, the merits of free markets and free trade, in a historical situation where actually for Developing countries to pursue completely free market and free trade policies is to simply subordinate themselves to the economies of imperialist Western countries. The, that's what they want. They want to open up third world countries to their capital, their commodities, and their requirements for cheap labor, cheap raw materials, etc., etc. So China, you know, of course, China has engaged a great deal. The whole process of reform and opening up has been, of course, about Greater freedom、uh, of economic activity, both within China and greater freedom of trade in China's relation with the rest of the world. But it has not been completely free trade. If it had been, China would not be where it is today. That's why I emphasize it is careful management of trade, capital flows, etc. Because otherwise, trade, capital flows, etc., can be very dislocating,、mm -hmm. uh, as you have seen in the experience of many third world countries, and that is pre it's precisely because China has managed. Its overall development, as any、uh, a good socialist country must do, and it has done it so well that today China is in the forefront. China has not only eradicated poverty, not only increased GDP massively, but today it is in the forefront of numerous technological fields. I was just、uh, happened to come by a few days ago this、uh, report that has been put out by this very. Anti-China、uh, uh, Policy Institute, but in this instance, it's very revealing what it says. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute,、yeah. of course, you know it, it has been very anti-China. But even this institute has to say that you know, of course, it's doing that in order to create alarmism in the West. But there must be some substance to it. So it says China is leading in thirty-seven of the forty-four. What it calls forty-four critical technologies, and these technologies span the area of defense, space, robotics, energy, environment, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, advanced materials, and quantum technology. I'm just quoting this report. By comparison, the United States is today ahead in only seven. So compare thirty-seven with seven. I mean, this is really so. So I would say that if you just take this sort of statistic, which you know, even if you dilute it a little bit, it still says a great deal about China. This is a most remarkable achievement. So you know, essentially developing through managing very clearly its trade, its capital flows, having industrial policy, all of these things have been very commendable. And in this sense, China's development, contrary to neoliberal discourse, is exactly like that of Western countries when they were developing.、Um, and in fact, let let me just say one other thing very quickly. You know,、uh, the West. Preaches neoliberal policy, but it doesn't necessarily practice it. And if we look at the economic fate of the two countries that have come closest to practicing it without ever practicing it fully, but come closest to practicing it, they are the United States and the United Kingdom. They are the countries that are suffering the most. 
uh, in terms of their industry. They have deindustrialized the most, their productive economy is most badly affected. And instead of productive economy, they have a uh, uh, they have massive financialization. You know, as some people say, industrial engineering is replaced by financial engineering. So, you know, this is what you get. And all it leads to is, is greater inequality and uh, etc. Weak productive economy. So overall, China's uh, in this sense, China is uh, uh, achievement is is close to that of the West. But what is even more remarkable is the way in which China's development is entirely unlike that of the West. Because if you look at it, the West in its development, when Western countries were developing, they had they were imperialists. They had vast colonies and even Western countries that did not have colonies, say, for example, like the US or Canada, uh, they had some colonies, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. These countries benefited from being part of the larger imperial system, from being at the benef benefiting end of the imperial system, which was largely set up by the European countries. So the West in its development benefited from imperialism and there were many benefits. They had they basically sucked capital out of uh, uh, resources, capital, labor out of uh, colonial countries and invested them in first world countries. So they had a big boost. China had none of this. China had no benefit from imperialism. So it has developed without the benefit of imperialism. And moreover, it has developed while being a target of imperialism. It has developed in the face, in the teeth of imperialist resistance. And so in these two ways, I, I think of China's development as being remarkable for these two reasons. So it is a resounding negation of neoliberalism, and it is still a remarkable achievement given what China has managed to do, as I say, not only without the benefit of imperialism, but having been the target of imperialism. So, and so that's why China is such a beacon, you know, for so many countries that have suffered imperialism, that are still suffering it that have suffered the lagging effects of formal colonialism, etc. The China's example is the closest they have, you know, it's not exactly a model. I think Chinese leadership is very careful to say that China is not trying to be a model. Yeah. But it's still, there's a lot in China's experience that third world countries today and other countries too can learn from. So are you suggesting China actually, through his own development path, is providing another option different from the Western approach uh, towards to modernization. Absolutely. And I should also add that what I also find very interesting as well, you know, looking at these two sessions and the and, and the work report presented by the premier, etc. Uh, I also find it very interesting that China today is forging ahead. It has no intention of giving up this enormously successful model and why should it and today i note particularly that the first two goals that are listed you know in the in the report are number one to expand domestic demand and that means essentially for china for for uh, chinese people to enjoy a better material standard of living of mm -hmm. course at the same time keeping up high levels of investment, particularly in critical technological areas, so that China continues to forge ahead technologically, create a modern industry, uh, create a type of society which is truly developed in the sense of employing all the benefits of science and technology and so on. And of course, this is only going to make China forge ahead. And I should also uh, 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 not uh, 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 forget that, you know, the West loves to bang on about an, the climate and the environment, but China is doing far more uh, realistically and, and indeterminately on the climate front. Meanwhile, to, while talking about climate today, what the West is doing is, on the one hand, they only w wish to permit those measures to benefit, uh, you know, to 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 address climate change and other ecological problems. They only permit those m measures which are profitable for their extremely profit hungry private corporations and nothing else and on the other hand by generating conflicts particularly like the ukraine conflict in which the energy question has been so deeply involved they are actually setting back the goals of climate change massively so yeah i mean in all of these ways and i i feel that you know china is by pursuing its path quietly determinedly knowing what it's doing not being you know, disturbed by what the West is doing. The West is clearly trying to provoke China. I think China will also earn 
has earned and will continue to earn the international goodwill that is critical for a peaceful world which is focused on development, etc. Well, speaking of China's de- development path and Chinese model, I wonder how do you understand this concept, China's whole process, people's democracy? I think there are different visions of democracy and the West has never learned to respect that. Um, I think I find China's uh, whole process democracy as an approach uh, most remarkable, I think, uh, for several reasons. First of all, I would say that it sees democracy as an ongoing project. It's not something that you establish it, it's done, you have to pay no more attention to it. It seems to me to be an ongoing project of constantly revitalizing, finding ways of making sure that people's desires, preferences, views, etc., are communicated to ever higher levels of the policy make or to the requisite levels of the policy making establishment so i would say that this is this is a constant search for making democracy real seeking to deepen and broaden the legitimacy which the communist party of china has historically enjoyed it has very deep roots in the revolution in the long process of revolution that took place before 1949 and its remarkable successes today so in all of these ways i think whole process democracy is trying to deepen and broaden this legitimacy and also such democracy you know i mean why do we want democracy because you know one of the key reasons is that if you if the leadership is doing something wrong then a democratic process should be one that allows for corrections to be made, you know, that people to say things that will correct the course. So this, the whole process democracy is, it seems to me, also designed to be self-correcting at every level of government. So there are course correcting mechanisms built into it, which I also think is really interesting. And I think the other thing I like about it is that it takes political processes as they are, you know, as have been practiced in China over the last many decades since the revolution and in parts of China even before. And it is trying to improve them rather than imposing some sort of abstract scheme, which can be of dubious democratic value. So And I find this also very interesting if you compare it to what happens in the West, because what you find in the West, you know, uh, more or less coterminous with neoliberalism, what Western countries have experienced is a decline in the quality of democracy. Mm -hmm. There have been lots written, you know, we call it democracy light, the hollowing out of democracy in Western Mm -hmm. countries, etc. Because increasingly democracy is only about elections. And these elections are one, essentially they are bought, you know, what's the best democracy money can buy, you know, the, the role of money in these so-called democracies is really uh, extremely, shall we say, uh, it, it robs it of any substance, right? So the focus of Western countries in this context where their democracies are losing substance, instead of trying to think of how sh- can we revitalize our democracies, how can we make sure that money, uh, social media, etc., do not play a destructive role in it, they they only focus on democracy in order to brag about it. So we have democracy and you have not, and that's it. There's actually no substance, but, you know, it's like a a school bully, you know, his toy may not be the best, but he wants to still brag about it, you know, and, and, and uses his, you know, whatever bullying power he has. So, as I said, the West only wants democracy for the bragging rights. Otherwise, it wants a quiet client population which accepts neoliberal policies year after year, decade after decade. And these neoliberal policies have been awful for ordinary working people in all Western democracies. They have destroyed their productive economies. They have encouraged a predatory and speculative type of financialization, which has directly contributed to the absurd and obscene wealth of a small number of people. And left the vast majority of the people wanting. I mean, you know, today you hear, you know, in rich countries like the UK, you hear stories about how people have to decide between heating their homes because Mm -hmm. energy is so expensive and eating. I mean, this is this is awful. You know, you are really rich countries, but this is what's happening. The inequality has reached like I, I don't think. In certain countries like the US and the UK, et cetera, I don't think inequality has been, you know, it's it's reached historically high levels. It has never been so high. And of course, it has created social divisions. Once you create inequality, that is the material basis upon which all sorts of social divisions will emerge. So you have, you know, all sorts of racism and, you know, the other political divisions, you know, populist versus establishment and blah, blah, and so on. 
and it is also promoting cultural degeneration in the following sense that our media, our scholarship, our educational institutions, etc., the idea that somehow they should all be devoted to the truth has evaporated amid mm -hmm. the pol amid completely false polarizations promoted by social media and the theories and, and, and ideas which do not criticize their role. I'm not talking about social media in general, but when social media is privately owned and what happens to social media when it is privately owned and runs for profit. So in all of these ways, uh, democracy in Western countries is going downhill. So by contrast, I would say that China's efforts to increase and deepen and broaden its democracy is really uh, uh, very good because at the end of the day you have to remember one thing the west does not have democracy it has a liberal democracy and the thing about liberal democracy is that it has been designed to keep a small capitalist elite in power OK, while giving the outward appearance of having elections and so on. Whereas in China, the whole process democracy is about increasing the power of the people in a granular, granular, realistic, tactile manner, in a substantial manner, and also deepening the bond between the party and the people. This is what it's about. And I think, well, I say more power, to, more power to it, you know. Let's move on to the China-US relationships. And uh, when addressing his first annual press conference, Chinese um, Foreign Minister Qin Gang said, the so-called competition means to contend and surprise China in all respects. And the so-called establishing guardrails and not seeking conflicts simply means that China should not respond in words or action when slandered or attacked, and that's impossible. My question is, China has made it clear on its commitment to peaceful development in its foreign policy over the years, and it has acted accordingly. However, considering the current state of China-U.S. relations, how did the situation get to where it is today? Yeah, I mean, first of all, let me say that Mr. Chin is absolutely right. I mean, the U and I just want to say, you know, set the context because I really like what he had to say. Uh, uh, you know, he, one of the analogies that he used is that if you if you're putting on a shirt and you put the first button wrong, then all the buttons are going to go wrong. You will stay on the wrong path throughout. So, you know, for me, that what that made me think of is that, you know, when he says that the U.S. behaves in a capricious fashion, yes, Mr. Ching is absolutely right. And the U.S. has always done so, you know, and this also has become particularly clear in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, document which it published on the 20th of last uh, of last month uh, which was entitled US hegemony and its perils it absolutely nails the whole situation i, I think it it has a, it's excellent it is factual and uh, it, it it is it's it's a major indictment um basically the united states believes that rules are for suckers you know this is a very uh, you know so rules are not for people like us it's for all these you know losers and suckers for all all the others so the key to understanding U.S. behavior uh, is, and by the way, this is what I argued in a book that I published about a decade ago in 2013, which was called Geopolitical Economy. And uh, it's also been translated into Chinese. I'll, I'll send you the link later. Sure. But essentially, I argue that um, notwithstanding myths of American isolationism, how the U.S. was reluctant to accept a world role, you know, the world wanted it to play a lead, you know, the low role of leadership after the Second World War, etc. In reality, throughout its history, the United States has not only been expansionist, but from the early 20th century onwards, it has particularly aspired to play a world role, displacing Britain in this position. And it has pursued this ardently and zealously. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, however, Unfortunately, history condemned it to pursue this goal in the most unpropitious circumstances. The world had already become too multipolar for Britain to continue being a, a leading power. And it was, it was also too multipolar to allow the U.S. to play that sort of role. Um, and, and, and moreover, it was also becoming what Hugo Chavez used to call pluripolar in the following sense that, you know, already by the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the new uh, uh, 
capitalist powers that were emerging, they already had uh, uh, productive structures and economic structures, which were quite different from that of Britain, which was the secret of their success. Uh, and moreover, by the early 20th century, with the Russian Revolution, and later the, by the mid 20th century, the Chinese Revolution, the world was also because so you had different economic systems altogether, you know, economic systems that were trying to build socialism. So so the world was becoming increasingly pluripolar. So in this situation, the United States could only pursue its ambition to dominate a single world capitalist order, not in a straightforward fashion, not by hook, so to speak, but by crook, as we say in English, you know, that through 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 devious means, um, through more through fraud and hypocrisy rather than any easy superiority, because the United States did not enjoy any easy superiority, you know, for a while at the end of the Second World War, the US was, uh, you know, US economy was bigger than the rest of the world combined. But this was not, not at all natural. It was the result of the war. The US economy doubled in size over the course of over the six years of the war, while the rest of the world's economies were destroyed by the war, while the United States on, on its own soil, there was absolutely no fighting. So anyway, it's important to know that you, the, you, on the one hand, the United States has sought to dominate the world as it imagines once Britain did throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. But the conditions for such domination were never good. And so the United States has always had to, uh, to, to pursue this by hypocritical means, by, by claiming to be superior when it's not and and the the reason i brought up this fact of you know the 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 us benefiting from the second world war uh, where is that you know people think that the united states arriving at a position in 1945 where it accounted accounted for roughly half of world production people think oh well this is just the natural expansion of the us economy and i like to emphasize that there was nothing natural about it it was a result of the war and indeed if you examine closely the United States motivations for entering the war a couple of years into after it started was precisely so that it could continue to derive economic benefit from it. But even after this achieving this position by hook or by crook, the United States did not find it possible to maintain an easy superiority. It lost this productive dominance very quickly as other economies recovered. And, uh, you know, uh, countries, communist countries developed, developing countries made their own efforts to develop, etc. So the world has been too multipolar and too pluripolar for the United States to exercise any sort of easy hegemony. Now, and and that's why you see the the, uh, the reason I brought all this up is because Mr. Chin basically pointed out that the United States says one thing and does another. My point is it has always done so and it has had to do so because it is pursuing this unrealistic ambition. That's the thing. Now mm. let's get to how China U.S. China relations got to their present extremely alarming situation. And I say alarming, but equally I say immediately after that that this. The fact that it's an alarming situation has entirely to do with the United States, because absolutely, you look at it uh, uh, objectively, uh, the United States has been creating unnecessary tension, entirely uncalled for tension between two nuclear armed countries, provoking a nuclear power as it is provoking Russia today. But, you know, it is basically thinks nothing, you know, in pursuit, in the vain and vainglorious pursuit of an ambition, it can never realize the United States is willing to put the whole world in danger. That's what that's the kind of power it is and it has become. So, you see, throughout in the 80s and 90s and even into the 2000s, the United States basically thought, you know, it, it, it had good relations with China because basically it was functioning under the illusion that by engaging with China, as China opens up, China will just become a subordinated part, a sort of, you know, lower part. You know, sort of uh, 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 yeah, like joining the U.S. to support his uh, system exactly, and not only joining, in fact, but but supporting, as you say, like as a subordinated, as a servant of the U.S. Basically, mm -hmm. and it soon became clear. It was already becoming clear, 
you know, uh, in the uh, in the first decade of the 21st century. And then certainly after 2008, it became very clear that China had no intention of being playing, you know, second fiddle to the United States. It had no intention of subordinating itself. It had no intention, for example, of remaining a low cost producer. It had every intention. And why shouldn't it of going up the technological ladder of becoming more technologically sophisticated economy and so on and particularly after the 2008 crisis which sent the U.S. spiraling into a rather serious decline in, from which by the way it has not yet emerged this is around the time when you begin to see increasing hostility to China because remember Trump's hostility had a precursor Obama said uh, had his pivot to Asia uh, already by 20, uh, 2012 or thereabouts. So there was already increasing hostility and suspicion, which came to, uh, we thought that it would come to a peak uh, in Trump and then with Biden, this would go down. But no, the Biden administration has continued. Um, and I think this is entirely a function of U.S. decline. The U.S. Is, thinks that it can somehow, instead of focusing on correcting its decline, it is it is trying to hamper China's success. So essentially, I would say that um, you know the rest of the world can see all this. They can they 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 see that the United States is in decline economically, militarily even because you know the United States may spend all these astronomical sums we constantly read about on its military, but. Has it ever seriously won any war unless it is a small matter of overrunning tiny countries like Panama or Grenada? It has never won a single war. So in that sense, uh, uh, all its dominance is declining. And I would say to be even its cultural dominance is declining. Even its moral influence on the world is declining because look, it, it, wants the, it wanted the whole world to join it in sanctioning Russia. And the vast majority of the world has had wanted to have nothing to do with it. So the United States, I would say, is ever more desperate, ever more hypocritical, ever more fraudulent. It's becoming a very dangerous and unpredictable enemy. And in this, I would say, I can only commend the Chinese, the, 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 the measured responses that the Chinese government has given in the present context. I can only admire it because honestly, uh, it is very easy to get provoked when the provocation is this high. But I think the Chinese government so far has behaved with exemplary temperateness and caution. As I say, measuring out its response only in order to 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 stall the U.S. only in order to defend China. So. Yeah, what you just just said remind me of what um, Foreign Minister Qin Gang said at a press conference that uh, he described China and U.S. as two athletes competing in an Olympic race, and the U.S. is the athlete instead of focusing on uh, giving its best. Um, it always tries to trip another athlete, even injure the other. So that's not a fair competition. Um so absolutely and that was a very good analogy as well it perfectly fits what's going on yeah then actually uh, mr ching also mentioned uh that the entire balloon crisis could have been avoided and also he accused the united states of plotting an asia pacific vision of nato and that could risk ukraine style crisis broke out in the region so i have Notice that the Western media's response to this was that uh, um, Ting's remarks has been very sharp, and but his words has been very strong. What's your opinion regarding to his comments? And also, what's the real purpose of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy in Asia? Well, I think that Mr. Uh, Ching's uh, remarks are completely factual, and I think that those who want to see this, those who are not invested in the West's response to China and, and the more generally the West stance in this extremely dangerous international conjuncture in which we find ourselves today. Those who are not invested in that will clearly see the truth of Mr. Ching's remarks. So, so I would say, first of all, that they are entirely factual. Now, I just want to say one other thing, you know, you're quite right, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Ching is saying there should be no new Cold Wars, etc. But, you know, it is really worth reflecting why is it that after the end of the Cold War, the United States has been reigniting Cold Wars. The reason is very simple, because the Cold War was not some sort of clash between capitalism and communism. It was, a, it was essentially 
a, uh, a continuation of capitalism's imperialism, which has been many, which is very many centuries old. And it was a continuation in a context where the communist countries, Russia and then China, constituted two of the strongest challenges to it. So that's why what is what was essentially an imperialist enterprise took the form of a cold war with communism but in reality and you know that's partly why you know it has reemerged what is the point of having a new cold war with russia russia is capitalist but the point is russia was a capitalist country which also in its own way refused to accept a subordinate position that the mm. united states wished to put it in and that's why you got the new cold war against russia which you can date at any point i mean quite frankly i mean is it not a cold war if you impose an economic shock therapy on Russia and destroy its economy, reduce life expectancy, as happened to Russia in the 1990s? But anyway, let's let's date it from 2014 onwards, you know, with the Maidan events and so on. And new cold war with China, some would say, began certainly under the Trump administration around 2020 uh, and so on. But anyway, I just wanted to point out that these cold wars are simply part of imperialism, which is an old strategy and in which the United States now is playing the leading role. Once upon a time, it was Britain, now it's the United States. But further, I would say that, you know, so so what is the, what about the Indo-Pacific policy? Well, obviously the purpose is to threaten and to encircle China. Uh, however, I, you also have to understand that while the United States is throwing everything it's got into it, like it, it really wants this to succeed, but we've already seen that US hegemony was never really, uh, 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 you know, it was never really achieved. It was never easy for the United States. The United States had to lie and cheat and, 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 and otherwise, you know, create the appearance of success when often there was none and so on. So the United States is already, and now the US is even less capable of trying to achieve this. So in this context, Although the United States is going to try its hardest, I wonder how far it will succeed, because you can tell that it's already going to create divisions among all the major countries involved, for example, Australia, for example, China, for example, India, all these countries are going to, uh, on the one hand, have is probably a minority, but very loud minority who are want to go along with the United States, and then probably a very large majority. Uh, which is which feels what is wrong? Why can't we continue to trade with China? Why can't we continue to have good relations with China, etc.? Because China's economic magnetism will make itself felt. You see, even now, Japan, for example, is not doing completely. You know. Is, is not being as hostile to China as the United States would like. It is continuing many close economic relations with China, as will Australia. Where are they going to go? Because China is going to be, is already is in, in many ways, the new center of economic gravity around the world. So in this sense, I, I one can only hope that China's economic magnetism will prevail, China's economic gravity will prevail, and it will make the sensible forces in all these countries finally prevail as well and not participate in this dangerously a uh, mad adventure that the united states is proposing to them hmm. and lastly professor um given all all of what you just said do you think china and us nowadays i mean china clearly says it, it wants to coexist peacefully and uh, it, that's its foreign policy. And also no matter it's treating developing nations or developing countries, but especially from the other side, in the case of the United States, do you think the two countries nowadays has the ability to manage the crisis? Like for instance, another balloon incident popped up. Where is the um, guard guardrail of this uh, China-US relations? Well, I think, first of all, as far as guardrails are concerned, I think China has plenty. China has a long tradition of responsible foreign policy. By contrast, unfortunately, the United States has a long tradition of completely irresponsible foreign policy. So in this, as I say, the uh, so, 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 so the question you're asking is, you know, is there any prospect of better relations between China and the United States? And I would say that the way to begin to think about this is to 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 put right front and center the simple fact that what the United States government is doing, what the U.S. state is doing, is not in the interest of the vast majority of ordinary Americans. They would 
by contrast to what their government is doing, they would benefit from better relations with China across the board, economic better relations, uh, you know, uh, diplomatically, militarily better relations across the board. And so the real problem is, however, that the United States political system is dominated by two parties who seem to be equally committed to targeting China. So the, the key to better relations actually will be when the United States, and of course this political system is not working. Like you are, you are hearing alarming statistics where more and more people are beginning to feel that neither of the two main political parties in the United States is good for the country. So mm -hmm. you can only hope that this type of sentiment, which is correct and accurate, will spread and the United States will throw up a political force which has a plan B. Right now, the United States has no plan B. It only has the one plan which it has had for decades, for a century and a half almost, uh, and or a century and a quarter. And it is pursuing this uh, 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 with, as I say, no stop button. There is no stop button in the United States. But so, so if, if 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 people in the United States manage to see the sense, or the rather manage to see the senselessness of pursuing this Plan A, and elect a political force that has a Plan B, then you, I think, you will see better relations. The there is one other way you will see better relations, and that is essentially if. China is able to ensure that the U.S. sees, the U.S. leadership itself sees the futility of its pursuit, hopefully without any conflict, but who can be sure of that? Because beyond a point, if the United States is sufficiently aggressive, China is going to have to do something to defend itself. So one hopes this is a very, very delicate moment for that reason. And one hopes that uh, th you know, the Chinese leadership has the capacity, which I'm, I'm sure it has the desire, but it has the capacity to bring, you know, keep things calm until the United States essentially exhausts itself in the in this vain pursuit. And as I said, the other alternative is if ordinary people in the United States realize the, the, the madness of this and elect a political force that is capable of presenting a plan B, which is for the United States to accept that there will be different economic systems in the world. The world is and should be pluripolar, that it can benefit from the existence of a wide diversity of economic systems and benefit from the achievements of others uh, and try to to essentially run a good race, like you say, as, as Mr. Chin said, uh, uh, run a race properly in a, as a proper competition rather than, uh, you know, engaging in foul play.